Yeah, yeah, it works. Yeah. Welcome to the second part of the first session of the third day of the uh, Akatsi 21. Uh, we will now have John Laser be talking about orthogonal transformations as well. Thank you, Leo. Um, and thanks to the organizers who are not in the room at the moment, but I'm sure they're in the coffee room for getting us all together in person. It's um, quite a, an interesting experience after two years. Um, so what I'd like to do today, um, I've just told Leo that I won't take 40 minutes, but I see I've got 38 slides, which I'm not quite sure how, how that happened, but hopefully um, I'll get through some of them quite quickly. So I want to talk about orthogonal trans transforms as rotors, but I want to talk a, a little bit more generally to start with. Um, oh, it's next slide, please, Roman. It's not working already. <laughs> okay. Ah, uh, yes. So what I'd like to do is talk about, first of all, how to move between one set of basis vectors and another set when they're related by a rotor, okay? In generally to start with, so any dimension, any signature. Um, and look at sort of what other people have done as regards that. Then looking specifically at orthogonal transformations, so N by N matrices as rotors. So I'm on an even element, an R, uh, even element R, such that R, R twiddles is one, in an ND Euclidean space. I want to look at some orthogonal transformations as matrices that I use all the time, and we use in engineering all the time, very, very famous and well-used orthogonal transformations. Then look at eigen, this a little bit, looking at eigenblades, how they relate to characteristic multivectors. And then what can we do with all this? Well, it's really nice. Um, well, can we do fractional transformations? Is that useful? And inspired by the talks of yesterday, or not yesterday, day before it was, it was Monday. Um, can I find the closest rotor to something which has noise on it? Now you have to bear, me, bear with me on that one because I was doing it at midnight last night. It may not be entirely coherent. Okay, so matrices and linear algebra. I don't know how many of you have looked in detail at Hessens and Subject Chapter 3. Um, there's absolute huge amount of material in that chapter showing how a geometric algebra approach to linear algebra can provide so many advantages over a conventional matrix formulation. And Leo, Leo and I have talked years about writing a book on linear algebra, dedicated to linear algebra, actually using and giving examples of some of these, some of these um, uh, expressions in chapter three. But to date, we haven't really, the GA community hasn't really exploited that chapter three. So David, this is with chapter three in Hessenus and Sobchik this talk. Um, so can we start to use some of these techniques um, to do some real applications, which are hard in linear algebra, or maybe even not possible to do with matrices? Now, you know, things are always possible if you're clever enough, but um, in, in, in geometric algebra, it makes it kind of obvious what we might do. So let's make a start. So this problem of a rotor going from <coughs> one set of vectors to another. So what do we know to start with? So we know in 3D Euclidean space, if I have a set of vectors E going to a set of vectors F and they're related by a rotor, so F is R, E, R twiddles, then we all know that we just produce a rotor by one plus F, K downstairs, E, K upstairs, where the constant just ensures that the rotor, that R, R twiddles is one. And any upstairs indices are the reciprocal frame. So I use this absolutely all the time. It's undoubtedly the simplest way to get a rotor between two frames in 3D Euclidean space. I remember proving this, then thinking, okay, it must be in Hessens and subject, and then of course it, it is. Um, in space-time algebra, so in space-time algebra, it's slightly different. So it's, again, it's the E's and the K, 
the Bs and the Fs are related by a rotor R. Then the rotor is given by FK downstairs, EK upstairs. Okay, so we're in a different, we're in a different metric. Um, and Shurikov in 2019 had a nice paper where he calculated, um, called Calculation of Elements of Spin Groups Using Methods of Averaging Clifford's Geometric Algebra. And we have this again, my E and my F are vectors, and there's two um, frames, in this case, orthonormal frames. The signature of the space was arbitrary, but no vectors could square to zero. Then there was a nice formula where R was plus or minus M over square root of M twiddles M, where M was given by this collection of um, one plus Fi downstairs, Fi upstairs, etc. So bear that in mind. So this is for orthonormal frames. And this was an ordered, these are going to be ordered um, multi vectors. Okay, now let's go to <clears throat> Hessner's and Sopcic. If I have two orthonormal frames, and we've known, um, you know, it sets the spectral decomposition out in chapter three, that in the Euclidean space, I can decompose my rotor up into um, a composition of rotations in orthogonal planes. Okay, so that was all very nice. And it was also extended to some non-Euclidean signatures for specific cases. And there are probably more that I have missed out here. So what Anthony is going to show you on tomorrow, Thursday, um, is something slightly new related to Dimitri's paper, um, but, but slightly different. If I have two frames, now I'm calling them slightly different things here. So let me take AK, and that has a reciprocal frame A upstairs K, and a B frame, which is related by, let me call B, F of AK, and they're related by rotor. So let's do it in n dimensions with arbitrary signature and arbitrary dimension, no basis vector squaring to zero again. Okay, so that's a, um, things break down if that's the case. Then the, the reverse of the rotor is given by this expression here. This occurs, this, um, these simplicial derivatives. Um, so it's a sum of these simplicial derivatives. So alpha is a scalar, a normalizing scalar, and this d r f of r is the r simplicial derivative over an ordered sum. Okay, so here's what here's what we get. Okay, so I'll write this down when I do a specific example. The ordering is important here. But we go from we reverse the ordering from the a's, which are the reciprocals, and the b's. So the rotor is simply the sum of the characteristic multivectors. So I, I'm not going to. So Anthony is going to show why that is and how it relates to other things, particularly Shurikov's um, formulation. But note the ordering. <coughs> As a little aside, if people aren't familiar with simplicial derivatives, this is how the simplicial derivative would be defined. And I think, I won't go through it, but if I take a specific term of that, just say the um, d by a2, wedge d by a, a1, acting on f of a1, wedge f of a2, I substitute for the derivative, the vector derivative. It's linear, a linear function, so I can take the coefficient out. I can differentiate. And because it's a contraction over upstairs and downstairs, I can replace by A2 and B2. Okay, so there's a bit of, um, if you're not familiar with this, then it requires a little bit of little bit of thought. But basically, it's a sum, the rotor is a sum of the characteristic multivectors, which is rather nice. So basically, I can it, this gives me some tools to investigate. 
and create some interesting linear transformations. Now, one little point. The method, and Anthony will show you the proof of that, this um, char characteristic multi-vector method will break down if the rotor that it spits out, if the scale apart is zero. Okay? The, the, the proof breaks down. However, I'll see, I'll, I'll say later, it's very easy to deal with if that happens. So I'll, I'll give you a specific example where that happens, and we need to then um, do a little, uh, a little something at the beginning in order that the rotor is not zero, scale apart is not zero, and then we undo it at the end, basically. So let me have a look at some orthogonal matrices very dear to my heart, okay? I'm going to look at the 2 by 2 hard transform and the 4 by 4 to speak. Cosine transform. So, you know, if you teach image processing or image coding, you always start with hard transform. It's been, you know, it's been very important in image processing. And, of course, the DCT is still completely fundamental in um, image coding. It's JPEG, basically. Well, 8x8 eight eight DCT is JPEG, 4x4 four four is JPEG XR, an extend, extended range JPEG. Um, okay, so let me just uh, state what I mean by this. To be clear, ortho orthogonal or orthonormal matrices, um, as I said, play a hugely important role. And one reason for them being so um, ubiquitous is that they are energy preserving. So we see these all the time because they preserve energy in your in your transform in your you know. You're doing lots of levels of transformation, etc. You want to preserve energy. So I'm, uh, my real M by M matrix Q is orthogonal if Q Q transpose is Q transpose Q is I. I is the identity. So therefore, the inverse is C um, transpose. So I'm going to just work for now. So I'm going to, although that formula was valid in any space, I'm just going to work in n-dimensional dimensional Euclidean space. Okay, so just to say here, I'm going to look at these, um, so what my aim is to put these into rotors, and as soon as I've got them into rotors, I can do some interesting things with them. So I'm first of all going to say, okay, if I have an orthogonal basis, C1, E2, up to EN, which is a standard uh, um, orthogonal basis, um, then my Q will take my E's to F's, where these are the columns, clearly about the columns of my matrix Q. So what is the rotor that takes my EI to my FI? What's the rotor that takes my E's to the columns of my orthogonal matrix? Um, now, the second way of looking at things, so that's a, effectively a one-dimensional approach. I'm just, I'm just getting, I'm just thinking of my matrix as acting on a vector. Now, of course, if we're doing image processing, what we do is we act, we would act two-sidedly. We'd act on columns and then rows or rows and columns. And again, this would be my block of pixels Y, um, X would be transformed to a block of pixels Y by acting two-sidedly by Q, X, Q transpose. Act on the rows, then the columns, or columns and rows. So again, it's important because it's an energy preserving transform. Um, and the important thing with these um, two-dimensional image processing techniques is effectively what I'm doing and how people have, have thought about this is I am writing my X, my image, my block of pixels as a linear combination of basis arrays. So I take, I take X is Q transpose, Q, so Q transpose Y, Q. I expand that so I get a lot of basis arrays, which are QI transpose QJ, that's my MJ basis array, 
where the two y are the rows of my orthogonal transfer. Okay. And so if I'm doing it in two dimensions, what can I, can I you know, how do I do that? Well, one, one way is to take my basis arrays, little basis images, and I can unwrap them row by row or column by column to form a vector. So one, one would be K equals one, one, two would be K equals two, and n would be k equals n squared. And it's easy then to show if q is orthogonal, these, this, these set of n squared vectors are also orthogonal. So can I look at for a rotor that takes that set of pixels, each one being a basis vector, um, the, my ek, to my set of orthogonal m, K vectors. Okay, so I'm kind of unwrapping my little block of pixels into a vector as you know we do all the time with machine learning, etc., and acting on that. Um, so given this is what we do all the time, because we we want to split it into this, it's you know, it's like a Fourier decomposition effectively. Um, and then we can do things like discard some of them, code them differently. So, as an illustration, let's look at the 2 by 2 Haar transform, or Haar wavelet. So, the Haar transform is given by this T, so it's 1 over root 2, 1, 1, 1, minus 1. It has been an important tool in image processing, and it's actually the simplest form of wavelet that has desirable characteristics. So, for those of you who you know, teach things like this, you always start with the hard transform. So let me act with the hard transform on the vector x1, x2. You see, this it gives x1 plus x2, x1 minus x2. So I have a low pass and a high pass filter. So I'm averaging and I'm differencing. So it's a very simplest form of a high pass and low pass filter. So, you know, with Eduardo's, Eduardo showed us some um, low pass filters, you know, this is the very simplest low pass filter you can get. Um, sorry about this. Um, so let me form those basis functions. If I do these basis functions for 1, 1, 1, 2, 2, 1, 2, 2, I get these matrices and they give this. Sorry about these wobbly lines. I, I looked at it and I, I saw I had black on black. So I have to draw them on quickly. So effectively, I've got the complete um, DC term. I've got this vertical difference. I've got a horizontal difference. And I've got this diagonal difference. So simplest form of nice filter. Oh, romantic stopped. Have to give me the next page. Sorry again? No? Yep, thank you. So let's unwrap that Haar transform as I've just described. I'll take those E1, E2, E3, E4, my basis, and I'm going to unwrap those basis vectors. So basically, E1 will go to this, which is the first one unwrapped, E2 to this, second one unwrapped, E3, E4. Now, I could unwrap column by column, row by row. It you know, doesn't really matter. So I want the rotor that takes E's to those F's, which are the right-hand side. Okay, so now I'm writing this down explicitly. I could use, it's not double transform, so I could use other things, but I'm gonna use this um, characteristic multi-vector formula. Um, strange bracket there. And the lack of a bracket there. But um, so, of course, because I'm at orthogonal, then the reciprocal frames are the, is the frame itself. So my rotor is proportional to, or my rotor reverse, one plus the characteristic five vectors, which is one E and one F. Then the char char sorry, characteristic multi vector, the characteristic multi vector with two E's, two F's, three and four. And then I have to have all the ordered, 
all the ordered um, um, terms as well. So I've, you know, I've missed, I've missed the, a lot of these out, a lot of these. So I just plug that in and it gives me this rotor. Now, actually, I am lying a little bit here because I've picked one that um, if I do do this, my programs come back and they give me that the rotor scalar part is zero. So what I have to do is I first of all get my F, I apply a little elemental rotation. That is enough to, <clears throat> to um, make this non-zero. I use the formula, then I undo the rotation. Okay, so it's actually uh, pretty easy. Now, if I unwrap the basis function column by column, I get a different rotor, which is related to this rotor by a small rotor that just commutes and perhaps negates the basis vectors. Okay, so what would, let's ask ourselves, what can we do with this now? Well, what would a fractional hard transform look like? Um, so having expressed the hard transform as a rotor, I can now look at fractional transforms. So let me take my rotor, and then we all know it's a function of a bivector. So I could take exponential, Cayley, out of exponential, and extract B from R. So I have to do um, the reverse. Now I've chosen here to do the Cayley transform. So my R is one minus B over one plus B. So B is one minus R over one plus R. So it's a very easy way to get the B from the R and get the R from the B, so you can check things. Now, I've done, um, so one of my students in Python has checked when I interpolate the Cayley transform and the exponential form, they're actually very similar and seem to behave very well. However, Stephen's just told me that actually there are times when it doesn't behave that well. Now, um, okay, so that's, that's um, something to bear in mind. So I could just create my new rotor by taking alpha b. So I just form my new rotor as one minus alpha b over one plus alpha b. And look at the properties of my new r alpha. Okay, so the whole transform is not very interesting. Um, so what I'm gonna do, oh, okay, yeah. So just for fun, if I look at r equals um, alpha is 0 0.5, then I get this quite nice, oops, I get this quite nice Lee patterned matrix. Um, and if I look at its basis vectors, you need to know that, they look like that. So I can twiddle around with alpha. So I get various basis vectors, so I can try and understand what happens when I apply these on, on an image, okay? I'm not yet saying it's useful, but I can, I can do it. Um, okay, so the hard transform, let's move, just um, because it's the hard transform's you know, a, a small thing, so it's not too interesting. Now the four by four DCT is interesting. It's a, it's a basis of um, JPEG XR, the eight by eight DCT is the basis of JPEG. JPEG is still used now, you know, it's, it's still, it's not hard to beat if you want to do machine learning, et cetera, but then you need to have a massive code on your phone or whatever, and you need to, um, um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a kind of, uh, it's not, it doesn't work for everything. You know, lots of machine learnings have beaten JPEG recently, but JPEG is still pretty hard to beat. Uh, and it's really quick and really easy. This is a JPEG DCT. Of course, this is related to the DFT matrix, so the discrete Fourier transform. So let's, everyone, everyone has probably seen this, but for the, if you're an image processor, if you're not an image processor, then um, this is what the 4 by 4 DCT basis function. So again, I've formed these um, arrays, this is the, the basis functions of the 4x4 DCT, and we can see it starts in the left-hand corner with, with the DC term, 
then we have increasing horizontal frequencies, increasing vertical frequencies, and as I go down the diagonal, I get the increasing frequencies in both directions. So, of course, if I um, apply it to an image, so here I can use Lena because I'm a woman. So. <laughs> 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 But there's been a bit of controversy about men. There's a very famous um, uh, image. I did have baboon on this, another image, but Stephen said I couldn't use Lena, so I thought I'm going to use Lena instead. So I've changed it. So basically, if you apply this to each block of pixels, you, know, you apply the, the DCT to, to each block of four by four pixels. Then you have the transform blocks and you take the top left of the transform block and I put it in that top left corner. Then I take the next one, I put it in yeah. there. So what I'd expect, because I haven't got these frequencies, is that I'm going to get, you know, the parts, I can build up Lena from a low pass image plus all the frequencies. And of course, in coding, what this means is that you can sort of disregard those subbands with no energy in, and you can code the others differently. So you can put a lot of your coding, effort, quantization, et cetera, those, these, this stuff down here can be really, um, oops, sorry, really coarsely quantized because there's nothing there in terms of energy, okay? So this is a basis of image coding. It has been for many years. So that's just to say, you know, why these basis vectors are important. So let's go, let's do a fractional, Let's form the rotor. So I get my rotor, same formula. This time it's all nice. The, the happens that the scalar path doesn't go to zero. So I'm, I'm, I'm in good form, form here. Um, I'm just going to write, again, I could use other methods. I'm using the characteristic by vector method. I'm going to just write this as one plus invariant one plus invariant two plus invariant three plus invariant four for now. Um, okay, I've just, sorry, I've just said down here that oh, the scalar part's not zero, so it, it's, this works out fine. So just, just for my benefit, really, I've actually written down the rotor. So, okay, very easy. It just pops out, simplifies to the rotor. The rotor twiddles, simplifies to, to this. Okay, so let's just um, check in there. Um, I then you know, just checked that these characteristic, characteristic multivectors should be invariants in my rotor. That's in, that's in essence and subject. Um, and indeed they are, they're all invariants, but invariant one to the bivector, totally bivector term, which is in, it, equivalent to invariant three, is this nice little thing here, which is clearly an eigen, oh, oh. there we go, back again, eigen bivectors were too much for it. So the, this is an eigen bivector, well, not an eigen plate. So the, we've known, and again, in chapter three, that orthogonal um, because orthogonal transformations can be split into these rotations in orthogonal planes, I can relate these to the eigen, the complex eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So this is just a check. So I, if I take my 4 by 4 DCT, get the complex eigenvalues and vectors, take the two which are independent, okay, so don't need to know the details of this, form the eigen bivectors, Eigenblades in this case, where and B1 and B2 commute because they're at these orthogonal planes, then this is in fact invariant. Um, it's not invariant. It's invariant. Yes, it was invariant one. Yeah, so it's invariant one. This eigen bivector that pops out of the characteristic multivector is the sum of the eigenblades, commuting eigenblades. So that's nice. But let's. Um, so I could also I, I could also take for, for any of my so this is a new thing that I've put in um, for any of my B's that pop out 
for whatever, whatever dimension I'm using of transform. I can indeed now split it into commuting blades by uh, Martin and Stephen's um, technique, okay, which we're, where they've solved the characteristic polynomials. And I can also split the rotor if I want to, which might be, might be interesting. Um, so, of course, let me do a fractional DCT. I'm going to use the Cayley transform again, forgetting that it might be unstable in parts. And I'm going to create a new rotor, which is our, use our alpha, which is using alpha B. Um, so the, so let's, let's put alpha equals 0.1. What would you expect? You'd expect a delta function at each pixel, effectively. OK, just, just a check. So this is what you get. That's good. Because yeah, I'm effectively not doing anything there. Um, let's take alpha is 0.5. Hmm, okay. So what am I getting there? Interesting. Um, let's apply that to Lena. Okay, so I've looked at some of the well, I'll tell you in a minute. Um, so this is probably not quite what you'd expect. So as I as I wind it up, alpha is 0.7, it gets more and more like the DC2. So the question is, I mean, if for a given image, suppose I compressed using a transform, transform which was optimized for that image, and the decoder would only need to know one thing, which is alpha, because it's standard. Now, interestingly, I have had a little go at this, and it's some images, if I have to wind alpha up to, you know, 0.9 before it gives any difference in entropy. And that's only for some images. So I'm not totally convinced about this, but I haven't really tried it for, uh, I haven't really tried it a lot in the coding um, regime. But it's interesting. Now, okay, so just in the, so I was going to put in some more um, examples, but actually I thought after Monday, I thought, uh, oh, this is interesting. So we had two talks uh, by Federico Thomas and Sogiel Sarabandi from the Monday session. And what they, what they did was they looked at um, forming the closest orthogonal 4x4 four four matrix to a set of noisy data. So we form something that was noisy. So I thought, well, what, what would happen if I use this if I use the characteristic five vector method formula directly. So I take my noisy stuff, put it in, I get a rotor out. Um, okay, so let's take, if I'm a four by four matrix, so clearly it would take the basis vectors, the I, one to four, to the columns of that matrix. And I put it in, and it always gives a valid rotor. What rotor does it give? Um, so last night, okay, well, so what, what, I, I had a go. So I took 100, not many, 4 by 4 matrices, which are orthogonal. I generated a load of fractional matrices just because I had this program. So actually, I've not taken a huge range of orthogonal matrices because they're all, they're all quite similar. I've added uniform noise to each element. So what I end up is a not, uh, I end up with a non-orthogonal matrix. I've tried, I, of course I can't try Federico's and Sohail's method because I haven't got it, but I tried the SVD, which is effectively Procrustes method. And I found, tried to find the closest row to using these characteristic multi-vectors and I compared the average error. So initially, um, now, I'm not sure I believe this fully because uh, it has to be, as I said, it has to be treated with caution because I did, was doing it at midnight last night after going out to dinner. So, uh, but it does seem as though the errors, certainly on this set of matrices, were very much smaller than what I was getting with SVD. Okay, now, uh, this is... <laughs> This is interesting because I, I can't guarantee this because actually my, my SVD stuff was all done in MATLAB. So it was their routines. Whereas the other stuff I was doing in Maple. Okay, 
So the I've got to be sure that the random noise, the uniform noise generators, I'd say. But what would be interesting is to actually take, you know, with um, the other authors, actually compare this spectral decomposition, a SVD, um, parasitic by vectors, and. Sorry for the interruption. These results are very good because the SVD is a linear algebra approach to predominant coefficient, whereas in, in characteristic, I'm not very economical. They're good if they're true, Eduardo. Right. <laughs> Let's see the last slide and then we can. Yeah, yeah, they're not. Yeah. So basically, I just want to, I'm pretty much on time. Told you I'd finish a little bit early. I didn't believe you. No, he didn't believe me. It hasn't happened yet. <laughs> no, it hasn't happened. <laughs> so, um, to conclude, so this characteristic multi factor method of forming a road between two sets of vectors, I think, um, in any dimension, any signature, or almost any signature, might have many applications. Um, now, I, I say Anthony will talk a bit more about that. I've been looking at some applications using orthogonal um, transforms. Um, I'm not hugely um, optimistic about it being good for coding at the moment, but I haven't really investigated, investigated it a lot. Uh, and also, what I haven't, I showed you those invariants. Um, so, so those invariants are, are, are really interesting. So invariants of linear transformations. So, like, we all use eigenvectors everywhere. You know, eigen, eigen, eigen things are very important because they're invariants of the system. And I haven't really even thought about how we, you know, how we might use this yet. So I think there's a lot here that um, one can use in engineering, certainly this information engineering um, regime going forward. And David, thank you for chapter three of Pestness and Subject. <laughs> Chapter four. Um, oh. <laughs> <laughs> that might be a hard one. <laughs> okay.